I'm Kathy Wallerstein, and I'm the founder and chair of the, um, of the Critical Humanities Spaces Network, um, which is a, uh, a sub-network of the Consortium of Critical Humanities Spaces and Institutes, which is an international organization um, that, just like the name says, brings together um, humanities spaces from around the world in humanities spaces broadly construed. Uh, for annual meetings and other activities, and we are the sort of different working groups uh, of, the, of the CHCI, and we are one of them. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a few words about our, our network, our, our, our group, um, because we are co-host of this event with Torch. Um, so the Critical, the Critical Humanity Spaces Network reflects on the work of directing and administering uh, humanity spaces broadly construed and encompasses perspectives from different cultures, societies, geographies, economic and social realities for expansive conversations about the work of the humanities, its purposes, and its publics, um, and more specifically, the work of spaces for the humanities, uh, whether academic centers or institutes, cultural centers, working groups, art spaces, and so on. We ask questions around the kinds of critical thinking and research that such, such spaces, spaces enable, around the work of those who direct, curate, and accompany and host critical arts, humanities, and social scientific research, and around the affective, aesthetic, social, and political lives that spaces themselves take on. Last year, we hosted two sessions um, uh, on called Forming the Humanities on Care and Traversing the Humanities on Space, the recordings of which can be viewed online on our website. Um, I'll tell you more about that. And this year, <clears throat> excuse me, we have, um, we've hosted, this is a third of our conversations uh, around the question of repair that we've hosted. And Pat's going to actually give you details on the three different sessions just to kind of set up um, you know, and frame today's session. Um, I do want to encourage people to sign up for our mailing list if you're interested uh, in our events. I mean, they happen all over the world. Some of them are hybrid. Some of them are only in person. But there's always recordings afterwards online. And this way, you can help sort of you can be part of the ongoing conversation. So there's a mailing list right there. If you add your name, I will then direct you to the website where you can um, see the other things that we've done. Um, so I just wanted to give a really big thanks to Rosinka Chowdhury and to Wes Williams, um, who took the lead on this session, which is uh, really very thankful for your work on this, and to Anbara and the whole Torch team for all of your logistical work. And an immense thank you to um, the Critical Humanities Spaces Network team and the core group, Rosinka, Pat, Morris, and Andres, um, for a really, really excellent, excellent year of conversations activities and deepening our work together. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And good morning, everyone. I'm Pat Parker, I'm the Roald Tyson Professor of Humanities at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the USA. Um, and in addition to being on faculty um, in the Department of Communication, um, I also serve as the director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities at, um, at UNC. Uh, and I want to add my thanks to the entire TORCH team here for uh, supporting us and also to Peter McDonald, who was also helpful in, in helping to uh, coordinate getting us here. Um, so building on Kathy's warm wel welcome, I, my brief remarks will be, <clears throat> um, you know, I'm, it's, they're intended to provide some additional background for uh, today's uh, wonderful activities. Um, so Pedagogies of Repair, a collective conversation, this session, is third in a trilogy of conversations meant as a critical interrogation of the concept of repair um, as it relates to the harm done by the legacies of partition and racial slavery. The first of these conversations um, was held in April. Uh, it was hosted by the Center for Humanities Research at the University of Western Cape. And the topic there was repair in the after. It featured work done by two scholars, um, including myself, in, in very different yet resonant locations. Professor Pumla Gobodo Madikazila at the University of Stellenbosch, uh, South Africa, uh, was one of the presenters, and as I mentioned, um, I was there um, as well. Uh, and both of our pro provocations there focused on the legacies of intergenerational trauma, intergenerational trauma in the body, in institutions, um, and on the landscape. 
And we were situating these as critical areas of as these critical areas as sites of repair work that begins with truth telling and accountability. Professor Gobodo Madikizila uh, presented on her work as director of the Center for the Study of the Afterlife of Violence and the Reparative Crest, uh, Quest, um, and also as Sarchi Chair in Violent Histories and Transgenerational Drama. Uh, sorry, trauma. Um, and I presented on my work as co-chair of the Commission on History and Race at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and also as one of the conveners of the University Studying Slavery uh, Spring Conference. So these topics were um, uh, presented in that context of, of, of thinking about repair, these sites of repair. Um, um, so the, the, the site of the second conversation was Santiago, Chile, at the uh, annual CHCI meeting. This was an international panel of scholars working in Chile, Ireland, India, South Africa, and the US. And they presented on the topic, repair, temporalities, and spaces of undoing. The focus there was on how we might think of the work of humanity centers um, and institutes holding such spaces as venues for repair. So each of these previous two conversations, as, as Kathy mentioned, um, um, is available to view on the CHCI site, the website. Second, second one will be up soon, still having trouble. Okay, all right, so the first one is up, the second one will be soon. And so now, having moved from situating repair within the context of persistent intergenerational trauma <laughs> to the particulars of spaces of repair, this present conversation shifts the focus to pedagogies of repair. What kinds of interventions and what kinds of teaching and learning does a concept like repair enable in this particular moment and in the particular places in which we work? How do pedagogies of repair relate to the changing, potentially transformative practices, pedagogies and places of reading, translation, adaptation and performance? So it is with great anticipation that we now turn to the panelists and artists leading this conversation. So thank you. And I'm gonna take my place in the audience. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Thanks very much for inviting me. And it's uh, really exciting to be part of this conversation. Um, my name is Thomas Cousins. And at the moment, um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology here at Oxford. Uh, but up until a few years ago, I was teaching anthropology at Stellenbosch University. And actually, just a few weeks ago, narrowly missed Patricia in, 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 Stellen, in, in Cape Town. So it's wonderful to be here and to be part of this conversation now. Um, I recently completed this ethnography. It just came out um, a couple of weeks ago. It's called uh, The Work of Repair, Capacity After Colonialism in the Timber Plantations of South Africa. It's an attempt to describe and understand the extraction of labor power from the bodies of plantation laborers in the making of paper, pulp, and profit as one figuration of what it means to live and die, live and die in post-apartheid South Africa. The timber plantations require backbreaking work. It's terrible work, the work of last resort in a region with extremely high unemployment and even higher rates of HIV. My book focuses on the question of how do workers in these plantations carry the wounding effects of this violent history of conquest, displacement, exploitation, and disease? And how do they respond to it, mediate it, <clears throat> and thrive in the midst of its remains? What effort is required to mediate the injuries that mark these bodies? And how do those workers endure the wounding and extractive histories of colonial and apartheid, dislocation, fragmentation, and oppression? After uncertain liberation from apartheid in 1994, how are social projects of ethical and, ethical and collective life composed as waged labor disappears, displaced by machines? So the book is centrally focused on what counts as work and its complicated relationship to extractive plantation labor in the 21st century and the ends to which different kinds of effort is expended. I focus on the concept of amandla, which many of you will be familiar with from the history of anti-apartheid struggle. 
Amandla Ngawetu means the power is ours, or power to the people. In ordinary language, it encompasses strength, virility, fecundity, capacity. The book argues that we should understand Amandla, I'm glassing it as capacity, as the object or aim of the work of repair, what I'm calling the work of repair. A concern, that is, with the depletion or augmentation of capacity of one's own, one's own and others. It's this meta-reflexive concern with capacity as a question of how one engages the fragile filaments of ethical life that condenses amandla in political, ethical, and bodily registers in ordinary life. Repair is not the opposite of fragility. Rather, an extensive literature on care, repair, and maintenance suggests that a different picture of ethical life emerges from everyday techniques responding to a constitutive incompleteness that engages in historically specific ways with the wounding effects of plantation capitalism. At the center of the account that I offer in this book is a group of women who labored in the timber plantations of northern KwaZulu-Natal around 2008-2010. Their ordinary concerns with Amandla draw together capacity and action, vulnerability and incompleteness. The milieu is constituted by plantations, homesteads, pharmaceuticals, wetland conservation areas, HIV and demographic surveillance, a coal mine as well, all in the fragments of ex-Bantustan homelands now governed by authorities both customary and constitutional. Amandla, as a form of ethical substance, brings into alignment a disparate set of fragile, fractured and wounding materials, including, and here's a list, the timber plantations, the conditions of labor itself, corporate nutritional support, the reactions of workers to those calculated calories, the wages, traditional, so-called traditional curative substances, homesteads, kin relations, and the effort itself to flourish. These workers build social projects <clears throat> in the shadows of a globalized regime of timber production, which makes the condition of this paper printing possible. Um, they contend with the devastations of HIV and work on and with the remnants, as I said, of the Bantustan state of KwaZulu, whose fragments are sutured by the values and norms and contradictions and failures of the post-apartheid developmental state. By attending to how this effort is composed of augmenting the capacities of constitutively vulnerable, incomplete and exposed persons, so that's a dense phrase that I will come back to, I show how Amandla is both diagnostic and technique, both resource and trope, in the effort to endure a labor regime that's profoundly entangled with the colonial apartheid and now post-apartheid state. So, Amandla is the central focus of a material concern with one's capacity. A capacity to labor, yes, but orthogonal to capital and ironically inseparable from it is also a capacity to become a person, to marry, to reproduce, to heal, to augment oneself, to build up others, to mitigate the threats of illness or of malevolent others, or to navigate the, ordinary, the, contour, the contours of ordinary life in this particular corner of the post-colony. And that list, uh, I'm, I'm glossing all the different chapters in the book in, just to whet your appetite. The concern with capacity itself, when seen through the messiness of everyday life, of the daily routine of getting to and back or to, from the plantation, of eating and cooking, of medicines, of flirtations and affairs, sex, marriages, bride wealth, illness and death, troubled ancestors, disappearing jobs, of navigating the fragments of territory and home and homeland, this is what I'm calling the work of repair. In Euro-American terms, the concept of repair has been developed in several different directions across a number of fields from Melanie Klein's reparation and Donald Winnicott's mending in psychoanalysis, to Frantz Fanon's therapeutic arguments, to Ta-Nehisi Coates' call for reparation for slavery, or Stephen Jackson's sociology of machines, or Gautam Baum's southern urbanism of home repair versus greenfield construction. Certainly, reparation and restitution have been central to debate in South Africa on how to engage the wounding legacies of apartheid. The concept of repair that animates my book, though, is drawn from Algerian French artist Kada Atiyah's 2013 exhibition, The Repair. I can show you a picture if you'd like. By juxtaposing, amongst other things, photographs of the disfigured faces of soldiers from the First World War with severe facial injuries after having undergone plastic surgery, known as the broken jaws, with fractured African masks, Atiyah reveals two pictures of repair, 
whose locations are suggested by the exhibition subtitle, From Occident to Extra-Occidental Cultures. A modern, so, on the one hand, a modern Western conception of repair that pursues an ideal of perfection by striving for the flawless recreation of the original state. In the consumer society cycle, for example, defective objects are disposed of and replaced by new ones. The repair itself remains invisible, amounting to an obliteration of history. On the other hand, the patched artifacts of ancient cultures, as Atiyah called them, openly show their sutures and clamps, and thus the history of the object. This is a somewhat different figuration of repair than that, make do, that, that of make-do and mend or maintenance or healing ecological breakdown. In one sense, the mundane crises that timber plantation laborers contend with are produced by the timber corporation's maintenance of a machinic assemblage of working bodies, corporate calories, chainsaws, sprayers, trucks, etc. A mandla, as the organizing concern for a thick set of techniques and practices centered on capacity, points in a slightly different direction as I argue. So for repair, Atiyah points the process of healing in a damaged state, whether in the form of bodily injuries, damages to cult or everyday objects, or the wounds of colonization that continue to make themselves felt today. Of Atiyah's concept of repair, Mantia Diawara says that we, need, that we see a broken body is a body that has had a weakness introduced into it, a hole that if not repaired becomes a sign of trauma. We need, therefore, to repair the hole or the fissure by covering it up, stitching it or decorating it with other scars to reappropriate it and make it familiar. Secondly, we realize that the broken faces of black and white, masks and people, utensils and human faces are interchangeable because their scars are relatable. They each construct a lieu commune, apologies for my French, the myth of which can be shared with the state in which others find themselves. Atia sketches out an arc from the practical notion of, re of repair, redefined as the practice through which colonized cultures appropriate the symbols of the colonizing powers into their own cultural idioms, to the juridical realm of reparation, as in the replenishment of a previously inflicted loss. By showing the scar, the wounds stitching, the concept of visible repair is thus directed against amnesia. By embracing these disfigurations, Diawara argues, we change the way we see the victims of trauma by familiarizing ourselves with the victims, by embracing their scars and letting them embrace ours. Quote, by licking the other's scars and allowing them to lick our disfiguration, we engage in an exchange that changes us in the process. Close quote. So Kada Atia grounds the notion of repair in a genealogy of the term reappropriation or rather the resituation of things as well as words, of both material and immaterial signs. More specifically, he locates reappropriation in the, in the thought of three thinkers. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon's property is theft, Oswald de Andrade, tupi or not tupi, if, if you're familiar with that uh, uh, anthropological ism, uh, and uh, Franz Fanon's notion of reparation and restitution of what people have been dispossessed of. While the term arose within European anarchism during the Industrial Revolution, i.e. reappropriation, right, it, uh, um, and developed within different colonial contexts, Atia suggests that reappropri reappropriation, quote, governs all relations between modernity and tradition. It sheds light on the parallel relationship between power and modernity, and more precisely, colonization and modernity. So how does this help to frame a mandla as the effort to augment capacity, which I'm calling the work of repair? I suggest it's both the modality of action that's oriented towards a specific history of colonial oppression and corporate extraction, and a form of imminent critique that absorbs an older logic of incompleteness and of necessary exposure and vulnerability to others within a political history of Southern Africa over the long durée. Hence, the political and ethical stakes of placing together reappropriation, recirculation, and repair. <clears throat> so a final uh, thought on pedagogy. So what work am I asking of the concept of repair? Probably too much. What conceptual, political and ethical work are we asking of repair here today? And more specifically, in putting repair to work like this, on what terms does pedagogy become thinkable when the whole question of what it means to live today is so violently thrown into question by the demands of wage labor and its disappearance 
of ecological crisis and even of war. If repair, as, if, as I've understood it from KwaZulu-Natal, is a material and ethical concern with mediating and augmenting one's availability and vulnerability to others, emerging from a terrible history of racial capitalism, then we might say that it's pedagogical, in, in, constitutively, in its exhortation to engage with others. It's another question altogether, though, to consider its, uh, the circulation and translation of this concept in other spaces and times of fracture or partition, to use the word, that is, is in this group, or division or abandonment. <clears throat> so I'm looking forward to hearing how others are thinking with repair and how this might articulate with that. Thanks very much. We'll move right along. It's actually really interesting because in um, Haiti, Grinnebaum and, and myself, we did a co-authored paper at our, um, which I presented at, um, at the meeting in Santiago and we were, one of our central figures was Atia oh, really? and his okay. exhibition on repair. So some interesting synergies. Um, so I'm very happy to be here at Torch and to be part of this collective. I, my name is Moritz. <laughs> Van Beverdonke. I'm from the University of the Western Cape Center for Humanities Research, where um, we collectively kind of reinvent ourselves on a day-by-day -day basis. So this is this is our um, our as as Pat said, our third iteration, um, and the repetition that's involved in having these iterations is, I think, also important for the work of repair. So. Um, coming to the same question differently, repeatedly. So this time, and, and quite intentionally, we are situating the concept of repair within a pe peculiar practice, one of pedagogy. And in my portion of a, like a paper in conversation with Kathy, um, which I think will be more of a conversation in some ways than a unified expression, I'll attempt to, in a sense, fill in this concept of repair through asking what and who repair is for. I do not think there's a simple answer to this question. In fact, I think that a simple answer will precisely not be adequate to the work of repair. In other words, I do not think that the question of repair can or should be reduced to a standpoint, as if a pedagogy of repair could be a practice in brandishing one's political identity cards. The pedagogue, as we will recall, in classical Greece, is the one who would walk the young scholar to their site of study. So what would a movement towards study under the sign of repair mean? In what follows, I'll briefly sketch two touchstones for my thinking on this, found in the work of Mudimbe and Winter, before setting out a pedagogical encounter with the memorial for the martyrs of the deportation, which are, the images are up, up there in, uh, uh, yeah, we'll speak to them. So, so one of the first essays by Sylvia Winter that I ever read was her response to the problem of 1492. And for those who are not familiar, 1492 is the year in which Columbus apparently discovered the Americas, or depending on your position and politics, the First Nations people of the Americas and the islands of the Caribbean found a wandering European who was lost at sea. This is also the time in which the Pope passed his decree declaring the earth beyond the meridian to be in a state of nature and therefore extractable. In the face of this weight, and in a moment um, when the question of memorializing this event was a matter of intense public debate in the US, particularly with the Smithsonian having embarked on its seeds of change narrative, Winter asks whether, and I quote, a new and ecumenically human view that places the event of 1492 within a new frame, unique to our species, is possible. So if there can be a third way that resists a slide into what she calls the neoliberal, neoliberal piety of multiculturalism, and we should never forget that apartheid defined itself as a system of multiculturalism, and instead produces what Winter calls a new, a new us, in her later work, especially for me in her interview with McKittrick in, on being human as praxis, Winter will trace how the interventions of the negritude and black consciousness movements make such a third way possible. And that's also the focus of my book, which is about to come out. I don't have a copy to show, so <laughs> imagine it. <laughs> it has the work of Bernie Searle, who's a South African artist on the front cover. Um, anyway, uh, so where am I? 
Yeah. Here, Winter draws out, here and in the essay on 1492, Winter draws out what producing such a possibility would entail. In brief, such an intervention requires what she calls understanding the rules that govern our human perception, including the possibilities of imagining or recognizing other rules, other rule-governed perceptions, and recognizing the revolutions and ruptures that have taken place in these. Here she spends quite a bit of time examining and tracing the grids of perception that enabled someone like Columbus to both make a revolutionary break towards the secular humanist world and to enslave, steal, conquer in the Americas and Africa. So, I mean, to enable that whole transatlantic slave trade. So such grids were not unique to what we now call Europe either. As she phrases it, and I quote, this, this, a governing grid of intelligibility, was to be true not only of Columbus and the Spaniards, but of the peoples whom they encountered. And she spends some time discussing the grids as these pertain to, as, to the Aztecs, Inca, and West African polities as well. These grids in Winter's reading hinge in differing but resonant ways on the production of an us a logic that inheres in the objectifications of Orientalism, Africa, gender, queer life, etc. This is her list. This marker of the us and the power dynamics that perpetuate an us as the dominant marker of this world share a logic and to that extent she argues there may be a pathway out. To be clear, to assert the existence of multiple grids, of what some of my colleagues call other universals, as opposed to a Euro universal, is for Winter to remain within the terms of the problem and to necessitate a repetition with too little difference. The defining moment of a revolution for us in her reading emerges in the invention of Césaire and Fanon, where man becomes legible as socially written, narrativized, as well as biological life. Within our frame, and I forgot to read my epigraph, which comes from Wadim there, which I'll read now, <laughs> which says, as a conceptuality, Africa has been presumed a transparent concept in most politics of alterity and by almost everyone as a key to the assurance of difference. Right, so that's, I was meant to read that right in the beginning, sorry. Anyway, um, within our frame, Africa, as my epigraph denotes, functions as a signifier of the limit. In his essay, which is where that quote comes from, Exodus as Allegory, Mudimbe traces the shifting lines of what it might mean to articulate a politics adequate to a conjuncture. In other words, he is asking a very similar question to that of Winter. Mudimbe, in his analysis, begins from the disconcerting repetition of the image of Africa, where it stands in as a sign for a lack, as the negative of a normative advancement. The persistence of this image of Africa um, is not accidental. Rather, Africa forms a function in global discourses. In his argument, of in, in his argument, in Mudimba's argument of development, where it guarantees the stability of difference. In other words, this additive notion of development and its critique, for example, as a development of underdevelopment, treats Africa as a discrete entity whose capacity must be enlarged. And here we, this is going to be my question to Tom, or has been actively directed and restricted in relation to another entity that functions as the measure of that development. These arguments around the development of underdevelopment or the global world order produced since 1944 through the Bretton Woods institutions are well known and do not need to be rehearsed here. What is of interest to my argument is the way in which Mudimbe reads the structure of this problem. Africa, <coughs> Mudimbe suggests, needs a new allegory where following Walter Benjamin, the concept of allegory is treated as a point of view, a way of seeing, that itself needs to be invented or developed. His word for development in this instance is drawn from the Hebrew, and I cannot speak Hebrew, but it's lehit patik, which he suggests carries a sense of addition, but also of the slow process of making visible associated with the manual development of photographic film. So development here is thought of as an unfolding, a showing forth of the relief of a terrain, not an end, but a thinking of the possible, where the concept is drawn, of the concept of the possible is drawn from Henri Bersan. Ultimately, the argument for Mudimbe will be that Africa, since it functions as a master signifier that orders a field, even if in its derivative form, should not function as a marker of difference, but rather of exodus, of a process of moving out of a problem, which he defines as hell. The, that's the, um, the endless repetition of its function as a signifier of lack. So what 
and who is ped a pedagogy of repair for. Within this framing, I would suggest that repair is for an us that is not yet. But it is for this us within the weight of Europe's claim to man since at least 1492. In a clumsy formulation, it is for the multiply excluded and towards a future where such an exclusion no longer holds. In Césaire's famous formulation, this entails a concept of what he calls man-made to the measure of the world, where this measure is framed through the notebook of a return to the native land as that earth that recognizes that not an inch of this world is devoid of my fingerprint. This is empreinte digital, which is literally fingerprint, but also has a sense of digital printing and of through printing of ink of, you know, the staining. A pedagogy movement towards this study would require an encounter that produces such a recognition, that destabilizes the easy repetitions of an us and them. So in that frame, turning to the memorial to the deported, the, mar the martyrs of the deportation, immediately, of course, to the camps of Nazi Germany. But the deported are also those enslaved in order to produce the wealth that is today the first world. And the return of that to Europe, to the Holocaust, and to the current slaughter of fortress Europe, as Césaire's discourse on colonialism reminds us. As you move, so as you encounter it, you move through a garden at the top that marks the public-facing arc of the memorial, a space you can inhabit without recognition. You can sit there and have a picnic with your family if you want to. You move, you move through that down a flight of stairs into a stone courtyard. The courtyard is shaped like a triangle, and the paving follows this pattern, thrusting the viewer towards its apex, a hole in the wall that reveals the river sign, through a grid. This symbolic view of the water as a possibly a marker of freedom is made inaccessible through the iron gate, but also through the iron blades that have been installed in front of the opening, thrusting back towards the door that will lead you into the rooms where the work of remembering is done. This movement is replicated in the paving with the final stone, a massive triangle again, this time aiming towards the memorial. So for me, and I, and I read the memorial, I think against the way that the, the martyrs of, the, de, of the, de, the, the deportation intended it to be read. <laughs> but for me in this moment, the resonance with the door of no return that marks the memory of slavery in what is today Ghana is unmistakable. The two events of deportation and death echoing into each other if you take the time, as I did, to abide by the ambiguities of this opening in the wall, climb into the space in amongst the blades. In that moment of tactile intensity, you have to literally weave yourself through there. You, you, in that little space, right by where the grid is, you suddenly hear the echoes of those who are speaking inside the memorial. So it's a haunting, in a more literal sense, by a voice from nowhere, in a language not my own. Well, I, they were speaking variably French and German in the actual memorial at that moment, remarking on an event that we all share differently. So this memorial, read in this way, can function, I would argue, as a pedagogic moment, opening towards an understanding of the grids of intelligibility that made both colonialism, slavery, and the Holocaust possible. It is the same claim to man that must be undone, a claim that marked us in our differences, that established difference is the defining marker for an us. It is here that I think we can find the work of repair as a pedagogy that doesn't produce a standpoint, but rather a new terrain in which a new us, an ecumenically human us, may become possible. Thank you. We had been hoping to have proper slides. Whoops, I'm attached. Um, but realized that there's so many images <laughs> online that it was just easier to, so I just, this just gives you a sense, you know, of, of the memorial and because we don't have a lot of time, we're not walking through every detail of it, but um, so thank you Moritz and I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, I will pick up from there. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the memorial for the martyrs of the deportation sits at the top of the Ile de la Cité in Paris, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> it was initiated as part of a group of Holocaust memorials in 1953. Um, building began in 1962. It was declared a monument in 1964. 
So the memorial <clears throat> so sorry, is situated at the, at the tip of the Ile de la Cité, which is one of two uh, islands in the center of Paris, sort of the oldest, um, the oldest part of Paris, uh, and facing um, the other island, the Ile Saint-Louis, which is a very kind of bucolic, small, peaceful place. Um, and it's situated in this very bucolic, sort of, you know, extremely pretty, calm park. Um, <clears throat> it's very easy to walk past it without noticing it. The site is uh, really mostly announced on a, a piece of the gate. I think I have that up. Uh, do I have it up? Right there on the second to the top. So you kind of walk past this gate and a portion of the gate is like an extension of the memorial. So it kind of sticks out a little more and it's, it's you know, that sort of, you know, menacing aesthetic. Uh, but it's nonetheless kind of easy to walk past it and, and miss it if you don't know to look for it, which is, um, I think, part of the, part of the point. Um, uh, so the aesthetic is stark. It does not intrude into one's line of vision as one passes by. Um, one might say it's a meditation on the visibility and invisibili invisibility of the Holocaust and traumas that permeate recent history. And I think the memorial really plays with that visibility and invisibility. Um, <clears throat> but it is an invitation to enter a path that will lead you uh, to, the, um, to the monument, but it is a subtle invitation. And um, Okay, so I went to visit the monument with uh, Moritz and with uh, Heidi Grunebaum of the um, Center for Humanities Research on the occasion of their visit uh, to Paris um, about a month ago now. Um, so the day that we visited the monument, um, Nahel Merzouk, a 17-year-old boy of Algerian descent, had just been killed, uh, executed really, um, by a police officer in the Paris Bonneau of Nanterre for essentially a traffic infraction. Um, I had been aware, and I think we had been aware that uh, uh, this young boy had been killed and that there was unrest, um, but it was really just beginning. And I know in my head I filed it as another tragedy to read up, read up on later, but, you know, but it wasn't really um, very present in my mind. Um, in the center of Paris, again, I'm sort of trying to sort of describe the setting, which is quite, um, you know, lovely and apart. Uh, uh, and protected, and this is the setting of the monument. So in the center of Paris, you know, I felt very, I and perhaps we felt very far from the outskirts of the city where things were going down, but of course we were not far at all. We're just two kilometers. So again, these visibilities and invisibilities, these sort of, you know, um, simultaneous realities uh, of, of, um, of who, gets to, um, who gets to live and who gets to die, essentially. So the significance of our visiting this monument to the visibility and invisibility of violence and terror suffered by one population at the hands of another and more pertinently at the hands of the state, while the streets were erupting in unprecedented numbers to protest the ongoing, ongoing colonial, colonial present of French Algerians was not lost on me. Um, <clears throat> in the July 15th edition of the New York Times, Amanda Gorman, the young black poet laureate who famously read her poem, The Hill We Climb, at Biden's inauguration, wrote an op-ed entitled, In Memory of Those in the Water, about the migrant boat Adriana that capsized off the coast of Greece on June 14th of this year, killing 600. The story of the capsized boat and the horrific ways in which its passengers perished was barely a blip on major news sites. Not long after, the story of five wealthy passengers on a fancy submarine that went missing gripped the world. I'm sure we're all aware of this, uh, you know, incredible juxtaposition of, the, of these two events. Um, examples of grievable and ungrievable lives, to use Judith Butler's terminology, abound. There are visible wars, Ukraine right now, and invisible ones, genocides that headline the news and fill our textbooks and those we barely learn about. A pedagogy of repair must not only allow the invisible to be seen, but allow us to face our own anchoring in social and geopolitical geographies in which our sight is oriented towards one set of harms but not another, and in which whether we are perpetrator or victim is often a matter of historical and birth circumstance. Deborati Sanyal details, details the ways in which French and Francophone literature and film have repeatedly sought not to singularize the Holocaust as the paradigm of historical trauma, but rather to connect its memory with other memories of violence, namely that of colonialism, producing what she quotes a memory in complicity 
attuned to the gray zones that implicate different regimes of violence across history, as well as those of different subject positions, such as victim, perpetrator, witness, and reader slash spectator. And, and that was a quote from her. So of the multiple histories of violence that haunt and act upon the present, one must always ask, in keeping with what Moritz was saying, which ones get memorialized and in what ways, as the results of which political chess pieces, what collective cultural movement to create which narrative, and so on. The task of a, mon of a monument to the Holocaust, and to any Holocaust, is to memorialize and educate on the particularities of that series of events, of course, that historical moment, its lineage into the past and present alike, and to universalize it as well. I will discuss um, a, a couple. Um, sorry, it's not, it's not an easy balance. Um, and this particular monument succeeds, I think, in some very significant ways. And I'll discuss a couple of those in a minute. But first, I must briefly uh, address the title, um, uh, which a whole paper could be written about, <laughs> um, which could be really read as undermining any emancipatory reading of this public intervention. So the title announces that the memorial is dedicated to the 200,000 French French martyrs uh, deported, suggesting that the monument is foremost a nationalist project, thus already an instatement of categories of belonging and not belonging. What matters, it suggests, is that the French name be salvaged. The monument is to say, so sorry, you were French after all. Um, we did you wrong. How bravely you gave your life. An admission of guilt that serves to reinforce the very structures of nationalism, xenophobia, and racism that allowed such a thing as the Vichy government to come into being in the first place, and which, of course, may well be paving the way for a Le Pen government in the not-too-distant future. So there's something quite sinister to me in the way that the monument was named. Um, and of course, it was named in a particular you know, time right after the war, and um, there's a lot to say about that. But I, I, you know, I did want to talk about the naming um, so even with these reservations about the verbal framing of the monument, it is still profoundly moving and, and I think in significant ways um, is a, an important project of repair. If, re if repair is not a work of reconciliation, but of making visible and of staying present with that and those who have been harmed, so um, harmed such that there cannot be amends, because repair in my mind is a staying with the pain rather than a fixing it. and. Um, rather than finding a fix to it, which can uh, always only be symbolic. So the structure of the memorial, again, um, uh, I don't know if you want to scroll through pictures or not as I talk, but don't, it's probably fine. <laughs> um, so the memorial is, is literally built into the bedrock. So again, this kind of like visibility, invisibility, um, it's you know, deliberately difficult to see when you pass by. To enter it, again, you first enter this sort of lovely garden. The fact that it's a lovely garden seems important. Um, and I read something that said the, the architect imagined this as a space of silence. So the garden is a space of silence. You're guided towards a uh, set of steep steps and descend into a space of what he called dépaysement, which um, means um, it's basically a disorientation of, of place and country. Um, the way I read the descent, uh, into this space was it, uh, either a descent into Hades <laughs> or maybe a resurrection of the dead as they become visible, right, out of, out of the bedrock. Um, but of course, I think it's, it's all these things. You emerge into an, um, an, an outdoor space enclosed by the walls, um, as you can see in the pictures. Uh, the tip, like a ship pointing out onto the Seine River, a barred window with menacing sharp sculptural object, objects pointing above it. Uh, as Moritz noted, the, the window evokes um, uh, the door of no return, leading Africans onto slave ships, and thus um, that's one of the many ways I think that this is, you know, um, uh, uh, a monument to um, to universal a uh, universal experience of or to, to multiple traumas, to multiple um, deportations, for sure. Turning around, one is drawn into a narrow claustrophobic entrance between the two blocks of stone, sucked in, as it were, into a crypt that forms the main interior space of the monument. The inside is stark, sober, and reflective. This third phase, what the architect calls the third phase of the monument, is one of presence. There are urns containing earth and ashes from the principal concentration camps, 
and a tomb of an unknown deportee. Along both walls is a dimly lit chamber. In a dimly lit chamber are 200 200,000 glass crystals with light shining through meant to symbolize each of the deportees who died in a concentration camp, in the, in the camps. At the end of the tunnel is a single bright light. It's really, um, it's very powerful. It's a very um, uh, aesthetically successful uh, monument. Um, the upstairs, a more recent addition, is the more deliberately pedagogical space, but it feels to me like a secondary space. Um, uh, the, the downstairs really feels like the main space, and it's um, importantly a space that doesn't impart its information through text, but through space and structure in a somberly reflective setting. Um, the only text which I, is important, um, well, it's, let me get to that in a minute. It's, it's almost impossible not to stand still and be with what has transpired. Um, when words do appear, they are poems, and it's quite important that this is the text on the walls or excerpts of prose carved into the walls as, with, as if with a knife, like all the writing throughout the monument in that sharp, stark font immediately associated with Nazi propaganda. And I actually tried to research what this typography is, um, and I, I just required more time than I had, but I'm, um, it, it's such an evocative font, you know, and it seems so specifically um, uh, Nazi Germany, um, and I thought it was moving and interesting and powerful that, the, that this poetry was also written in this font. Um, as such, the poems seem to exceed the font they are written in, emerging as testaments to the persistent ability of art in all its forms to face the unspeakable, to draw out other rules of perceptions to echo winter, and, and to imagining otherwise. This is a space to stand silently and to inhabit the unbearable. It, the downstairs at least, is not a space, space of explanation. This is the first task of repair in my view, and it is unthinkable to me um, without aesthetic mediation. Audre Lorde, as Pat uh, and I, um, as Pat reminded me this morning, told us that poetry is not a luxury very wisely told us that poetry is not a luxury. The carvings of poetry onto the walls of the monument announce that poetry art as a lifeline and as a frame for human emancipation, even in the darkest of times. The writers whose prose and poetry are etched into the walls include um, the surrealist uh, writer and, um, and resistance um, activist, uh, Robert Desnos, who himself was deported, uh, Sartre, Aragon, Saint-Exupéry, uh, and I think one more, I'm forgetting who. Um, I'm going to read you one brief poem by Desnos uh, uh, that's on the wall that reads, I have dreamt so very much of you, I have walked so much, loved your shadow so much, that nothing more is left to me of you. All that remains to me is to be the shadow among shadows, to be a hundred times more of a shadow than the shadow, to be the shadow that will come and come again into your sunny life. Keeping with Robert Desnos, I just want to end with a passage by um, uh, an essay by Susan Griffin um, from her es uh, a passage from the essay, Can Imagine, Can Imagine Save Us, um, by Susan Griffin. Um, Even in the grimmest of circumstances, a shift in perspective can create startling change. I'm thinking of a story I heard a few years ago from my friend Odette, a writer and survivor of the Holocaust. Along with many others who who crowd the bed of a large truck, she tells me, was Robert Desnos, who is being taken away from the barracks of the concentration camp where he has been held prisoner. Leaving the barracks, the mood is somber. Everyone knows the truck is headed for the gas chambers. And when the truck arrives, <clears throat> no one can speak at all. <clears throat> and I'm even losing my voice. <laughs> even the guards fall silent. But this silence is soon interrupted by an energetic man who jumps into the line and grabs one of the condemned. Improbable as it is, Odette explains, Desnos reads the man's palm. Oh, he says, I see you have a very long lifeline, and you're going to have three children. He is exuberant, and his excitement is contagious. First one man, then another offers up his hand, and the prediction is for longevity, more children, abundant joy. As Desnos reads more palms, not only does the mood of the prisoners change, but that of the guards too. How can one explain it? Perhaps the element of surprise has planted a shadow of doubt in their minds. If they told themselves these deaths were inevitable, this no longer seemed inarguable. 
uh, this no longer seems so inarguable. They are in any case so disoriented by the sudden change of mood among those who they are about to kill that they are unable to go through with the executions. So all the men, along with Desnos, are packed back into the truck and taken back to the barracks. Desnos saved his own life and the lives of others by using his imagination. So I just wanted to end with that um, passage um, that, uh, you know, the, the aesthetic's capacity to remake the world, indeed. Um, so I'm just going to end there on that series of re reflections. Thank you so much.